live from Flagler County. Welcome to Best Picture This, where it is always Oscar season. I'm Mike. And I'm Brian. In this show, sponsored today by the Palm Coast Observer, we reevaluate every Best Picture nominee from the 21st century and even some movies that used to be Disney cartoons. <laughs> and some movies that were remade into Oscar winning films. I mean, this one did go home with one Oscar, and I'd argue that it was angling for more than that. But Mulan is the movie of the day, and that's another movie in our summer series. It is being shown for free at the Flagler County Public Library at 1 p.m. Saturday, May 29th. The City of Palm Coast also has free movies at Central Park on the second Friday of each month from March to October. So the next one is Trolls World Tour on June 11th, and then they'll do Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle on July 9th, and we'll try to help you get caught up with those movies as they uh, approach. I'm especially looking forward to Trolls, Brian. But movies know. are always more fun when you can talk about them. So thanks for joining us. Don't forget to subscribe to the Palm Coast Observer's YouTube page for Best Picture This episodes covering most of the Father County Library and City of Palm Coast movies happening this summer. If you want to sponsor this show, email us at bestpicturethis at gmail.com. All right, so let's get into Mulan, 2020, the 2020 version. Um, the nominations I saw for this were Best Costume Design and Best Visual Effects. I thought it was only nominated, though. I hate to fact check on live TV, but I thought they only nominated. We'll double check that and put it in the comment. Yeah, I think it was Best Music. Oh, that could be. <laughs> <laughs> it did win a People's Choice Award for the favorite action movie in 2020. I don't know how many others there were to compete with in 2020, but it did win a People's Choice Award. Um, so one thing that helps me personally enjoy the movie, and I wanted to share that with anybody who's, who's watching and with you, Mike, is that a lot of times when I watch a foreign film, um, I don't really know who the actors are very well. Mm -hmm. And although this is, this is, you know, you know, released in America and everything. I don't know if you would consider it a foreign film. Everybody has, you know, yeah. they're all speaking English. Yeah, it's true. But um, so some of the actors in this are really big deal in China and Asia. For example, Donnie Yen. He's one of the highest paid actors in Asia. Jet Li is someone that a lot of people know about. He plays the emperor. Um, he starred in Hero and a lot of other movies. Wow, you know what? I didn't even recognize him. Yeah, I didn't either at first. I had to double check that. But I can't Jet believe that. Wow. Jet Li is the emperor. Yeah. Um, Yifei Liu plays Mulan, and she is a rising star in, in Asia. She's also a singer, like a pop singer. Gong Li um, play, has, a, has a, a big role in this movie, and she is considered one of China's best actresses. Uh, Jason Scott Lee was Mowgli in 1994's um, live action Jungle Book. So there's kind of like a pretty impressive cast in this movie. It's just that if you're kind of encountering them for the first time, you may not realize it. And I didn't um, necessarily either until I you know, looked it up. There is one person who's missing from this movie. Who's that? M Mushu. Is that the dragon? Mushu, I think so. I mean, the dragon. The cartoon. Have you seen the cartoon version? I have, it's been a long time, but I've seen it. I have not, so I think that may play into a lot of my impressions of the movie that I didn't have that to compare it to. Hmm. Okay. Um, all right. So coming up in the show, if you're a familiar, if you're a fan of Best Picture This, or you've seen our podcast before, you can also subscribe. Um, there's a button on the corner of this uh, screen where you can subscribe to the Apple Podcast, and you can get it everywhere else, Spotify, etc. Um, we do. On the show, we do the Farley Awards, which is where we each pick our favorite mo moment of the movie, the most awesome moment of the movie. We each do a golden take, and then we ask each other a question. This, this, in this movie, this question is designed to chase the chicken of truth across, across the rooftops of life. We'll also imagine what might have been, and then we'll talk some trivia. So let's go into Farley Awards first. Most awesome moment of the movie. And for me, Brian, do you remember when Mulan's army is preparing for battle and her team is kind of clustered in this circle, obviously scared. Some of them are trembling and they're openly talking about being afraid, which is kind of a big deal because it hadn't happened before in this movie. They're all trying to act tough for the most part. Mm -hmm. Then Mulan gives this speech to inspire the group. And I pointed out to my eight-year-old Charlotte that Mulan's hand was trembling in the scene which meant that she was scared too, but she acted brave for the sake of the group because she's a real leader. 
And I was proud of myself. You know, I thought this is a good parenting moment. I'm turning this battle scene into a life lesson. And then if, Charlotte turns if to me. Thought, if anyone thought that you were not a good parent, like, <laughs> yeah. I might not have thought. Now I know that you are. And I had to prove it toward the top of the show. But let me just take myself down a peg. Right after I said this, Charlotte turns to me and she goes, yeah, it's kind of like the Battle of the Bands in My Little Pony. <laughs> and yeah, that's when I realized that I made no impact whatsoever. <laughs> she already knew that. I, I guess if so. You watch My Little Pony. I mean, you don't really need parents. I don't. If you watch Little My Little Pony, then you understand how battles work, and they all have you know <laughs> pop music behind them. But really, my best moment is the first attack on the kingdom. This is when Khan's soldiers are advancing on their black horses, and the witch, who I know I'm going to butcher the pronunciation of her name. I think it's Zan Yang. She appears in the village and kind of shows off her powers for the first time. She's the one that they refer to as the witch all movie long. So this sequence is a little bit Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. It's a little bit Hero. It's a little bit House of Flying Daggers. And the whole movie is kind of like that. You know, characters running on walls, floating on rooftops, using bright colors in fight scenes, and sometimes even using fabric as a weapon in fight scenes. That's something that you see in, in Flying Daggers and Heroes, especially. And I think that that's kind of a strength and a weakness of it because it does look cool. But at the same time, the movie never really invents any of its own visual identity, I didn't think, um, or lives up to the quality of those other movies I mentioned. But at this point, I was I was in. I was intrigued to see what would happen next. Yeah, very good. Um, I, what I liked about that scene in particular after Milan's kind of speech to her uh, to her fellow soldiers, which I thought was 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 a good moment. I love how it cuts directly to a super slow-mo of the bad guys approaching. And I thought that was a great juxtaposition. But I, I chose my Farley moment for the, for my Farley award for um, the most awesome moment pretty early in the movie. Um, it's when Mulan is getting her makeup done. Um, I love how, you know, you start out with this like green sheet or canvas or something, and then all the pieces of, of makeup, you know, plop up onto the, onto the, uh, onto the mat. And um, it kind of reminded me of like a Wes Anderson sort of approach to like this this weird like color symmetry kind of it, it was kind of like a quirky little special effect that mm -hmm. all these were showing up um, and uh, you know then you get these little details of Mulan getting all of her makeup applied the the pencils the foundation whatever other kinds of things that a lot. end up on people's faces. Um, like that, but it was like this Instagram demo of, you know, of, of uh, makeup. And um, I thought that was, that was um, pretty interesting because you kind of, it sets up the, the sort of expectations of what a woman in that society was supposed to do and supposed to look like. And, um, but they had some fun with it. And I thought that was pretty cool. And that's early on in, in the movie. It is. Unlike Mike, I'm not really giving much away here. <laughs> um, I also really liked the locations and I looked afterwards just to make sure that they were real and, and not, you know, put in digitally. And they did shoot this movie in New Zealand and in China. So I guess that explains how they were able to get some of these really cool, vast sweeping shots of landscapes. Really good stuff. Right on. But if you're just joining us, welcome. We're talking about Disney's live action Mulan playing at 1 p.m. Saturday, May 29th at the Flagler County Public Library. But do you have a favorite movie that you feel doesn't get the attention it deserves? If you become a patron of this show, Best Picture This, by visiting patreon.com slash bestpicturethis, you can help choose a movie for one of our future bonus episodes. Our first patron curated episode will be on David Cronenberg's body horror film, The Fly, from 1986, airing live next week. Actually, right, Brian, next week on our Facebook page. Next and our, our second patron curated episode will be on Zach Braff's Garden State, and we've got a third that we'll be announcing soon. Very good. You can also listen to our library of 30 episodes and counting of Best Picture of This podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. And again, there is a button in the left part of the screen that allows you to uh, check out the, the the rest of what, we, what we've been doing. Smash <laughs> that subscribe button, right, Brian? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, golden takes. <clears throat> golden you know, takes. You have no hot takes on Best Picture This. No, no, no. Only golden. Golden. What is yours? In this version of Mulan, characters have magic or chi. 
And that adds a new element to the story that we didn't get in the original. You know, it pumps up the action scenes and makes it more fantastical. But I think that that change was a mistake. This is a $200 million movie. It's the most expensive ever directed by a woman. And this addition, you know, essentially giving Mulan superpowers, it feels like a way to make this more like a Marvel movie. Disney obviously owns Marvel. They have a formula they know works. But I think it cheapens the themes a little bit because I think about the scene that you brought up, the makeup scene. Another one, I was with you. I think that this is a really smart and well done scene also. She gets all dolled up for this potential husband. You know, it's basically she's going to meet the matchmaker. And she jokes to her sister about the makeup. She says something like, this is my sad face. This is my curious face. And her face changes, you know, it doesn't change at like all. It stays completely the like same. Like a Darth Vader t-shirt. No. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I really like that moment because it plays up the idea as makeup as a sort of mask forced onto women by society. You know, their truth underneath doesn't matter. That's not what's important. Only that their exterior conforms and then they become completely anonymous through that conformity. But by making chi, what's important, doesn't it undermine that whole thing? You know, rather than it being Mulan's talent, determination, practice, passion, rather than those being the things that makes her important and who she ends up ultimately being, it kind of makes her chosen instead of her being the one doing the choosing, the fact that she has these superpowers. So toward the end, I think that they, this kind of hammers home even, even further. Uh, the war is over. She heads back home to see her family and her sister tells her right away that she has been matched with a husband and she's excited. And it becomes clear, at least it was to me, that her sister could never rise out of this role like Mulan did because she doesn't have chi. So the only way that she has to give her family honor, which is the biggest thing in the world in this movie, you know, they repeat the word honor a hundred times. The only way that she could bring honor to her family is by marrying a man and then serving him. And I think that Mulan even asks her at one point, you know, what's this guy like? And the first thing her sister says is handsome. So I think it's almost like a signal that even men are not free from these surface judgments. But I don't think that the movie's making that point. But I think that it is there. And the fact that they don't seem fully aware of it, kind of playing the sister relationship up for sweetness, I think says a little something about where their priorities were in the making of this. And I think it was pretty clearly in the production, the, the value, you know, the, the scale and the scope of, of the story. Yeah, I guess I didn't have the same kind of problem with it in that way because I saw it as rather than than um, I guess it, it seemed like it was it was fulfilling some of the expectations of the martial arts fantasy genre, hmm. and it's sort of a metaphor for what makes somebody special. Um, but I, I I see what you're saying. If you wanna if you wanna deconstruct, you know, Disney live action, you can. It's, I do. That's why we're here, Brian. If we're not deconstructing, what are we doing? <laughs> Uh, my golden take is that movies are always better when no one sings any songs. <laughs> um, no, I'm joking, sort of. But the fact is that this movie is not trying to duplicate um, the. It's not trying to duplicate the movie, the the, the cartoon. Yeah. And I think a lot of people have that expectation. Somebody was saying that on Facebook as well. Um, that they were kind of worried that didn't really want to see it because it wasn't really like going to be like the favorite cartoon that they saw. But this movie is not, um, this movie is based on something a lot older. Um, the Ballad of Mulan is what this is, is what it's based on from like, I, I forget the year, but it's, it's very old. You Centuries, know, it's, yeah. It's ballad, yeah. It's like an ancient, ancient thing. So the Disney musical cartoon is a remake of that, the retelling of that. And I think that helps a lot to understand where this, this live action movie is coming from. There's a silent film of this story from 1927. There were there are multiple from in the 30s, the 60s, the 90s. The year Disney did it, there was a 1998 cartoon that came out, a direct-to-video Chinese cartoon where everyone was an animal and Mulan was a part butterfly. Um, there was a live action Chinese movie in 2009 based on this story. So this is not like Disney hijacking its own material and changing it up. This is just like a traditional story going back a long, long time. And I think that made me kind of appreciate the story, what it was trying to do better once I, once I found that out.
Can it be both though? Can it be Disney taking, you know, a old legend and remaking it, but also kind of hijacking its own stuff? I mean, this is really what Disney has always done. I mean, Snow White, all these different stories from back in the day, they're all like legends, Little Mermaid. I mean, they, they take all, they, they didn't come up with new stories for these things. Um, so, but once you do, and it becomes like the mythology of our childhood, of our day, um, and our kids' childhood, um, it's, it is pretty hard to separate it. So, um, and, and, you know, the songs become just as much part of the experience as, as, uh, anything else. So they do incorporate the melodies though. They do. From, it's in that, those original movies. And I didn't even know those melodies. So my, my wife and my daughter had to be like, Hey, look, they're doing this. They're doing the song. But to me, it didn't bother me. So I don't know. I didn't actually get a lot of feedback from them on whether they loved the remake or not, but. Hmm. All right, let's go to uh, our questions. The question designed to chase the chicken of truth <laughs> across the rooftop of life. So I'll go first. All right, hit me. Does a movie about Asian culture need to be directed by an Asian director? <laughs> this film got a lot of criticism because uh -huh. They didn't have any Asians on the crew, on the production, the director's white. Um, however, Ang Lee was originally chosen to direct it, which I thought was interesting. Um, he declined because he was busy promoting Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk from in, in 2016, his 2016 movie, which to me, that's sort of like saying that I was washing my hair, you know, and I couldn't make it. <laughs> yeah. um, Billy Lynn's long halftime walk got 44% and made $1.7 million in the box office. Wow. Um, so does a movie about Asian culture need to be made by an Asian director or is it just exploiting the Asian story? I, I'm not sure that this is a movie about Asian culture. Um, is it because I, the Disney has this filter in between? So now it becomes like, this is, this is Disney. Yeah, yeah, in, in a way. Um, but I, I mean, to your point, I think that in 2021, the smart thing probably would be to get an Asian director to direct a movie that's a, that's about, you know, the Asian culture. And, and they're probably going to be able to bring something to it that a white director wouldn't be able to bring, you know, so that that is important. But just for the sake of representation, it probably is important to start doing that. And I think that a company like Disney is very aware of that. You know, Chloe Zhao, like we've mentioned a few times, she won for Nomadland. She's making Marvel's Eternals. You know, that's going to be a, a one of the next big superhero movies in this Marvel phase four or whatever they're calling it. So I think that they are trying to make strides to do that. Maybe um, this one was in production a little bit more than they realized that they should be. This one did go through, as they call it, production hell for, you know, like 10 years. Um, mm -hmm. our, our sub others, we talked about Sonic the Hedgehog last week, going through all kinds of iterations because you just, you don't want to get this like beloved story wrong and and, and risk alienating yeah. everybody. I did want to bring up um, a little bit about the director um, just because I wasn't really that familiar with her and maybe people who want to go watch this movie um, could you know, enjoy it more if you know a little bit about her. This is Nikki Caro, N-I-K-I, -K Caro, C-A-R-O. She directed Whale Rider in 2002, uh, which was pretty cr critically acclaimed. North Country in 2005, and that got a couple nominations for acting. Charlize Theron and Frances McDormand were both nominated for acting. And so I think that kind of gave her some credibility, Nikki Caro, yeah. uh, as a director. Um, then she directed McFarlane USA and The Zookeeper's Wife in 2017. Her next movie after this one is going to be Beautiful Ruins, which is based on a, a novel that I really liked, and it'll be pretty interesting. It's kind of a period piece about writers, and it's a love story. Um, so that's Nikki Carroll, for those who aren't familiar with her, and as I wasn't before you know, prepping here. Are you ready for my question? I'm ready. So let's go back to the remake talk. Disney has been on a mad run recently pumping out these live action remakes of their, of their classics. But their first one was actually back in 1994. That was Rudyard Kipling's The Jungle Book in 94. Then in 96, they made 101 Dalmatians. Glenn Close was in that, then a sequel, and then took a little break. Before Tim Burton made his Alice in Wonderland in 2010, another little break, 
Then from 2015 on until Mulan, it's just been a sprint. This is all they've been, I mean, yeah. other, other things, but in that time span, you had Cinderella, The Jungle Book, Beauty and the Beast, Dumbo, Aladdin, The Lion King, Lady and the Tramp, Mulan, and Cruella is actually coming out, I think, next Friday, I Emma, believe. Emma Stone, love Emma Stone. Yeah, so that'll be coming out on Disney+. Plus. And during that time, I'm also not counting Maleficent, Alice Through the Looking Glass, Christopher Robin, and a few other words. So my question to you is, um, why? Because <laughs> they are predictably enjoyable and will make a lot of money. I mean, what, but, but at the same time, I thought a lot about this whole remake, you know, tell an old story again. Is that just kind of the artists, like, is that cheap? You know, why don't they come up with their own new story? Yeah. But, but this is what Shakespeare did. I mean, there's a long tradition of this. He retold the histories. You know, he, he did not um, make up his own stories most of the time. So I don't think that there's really anything wrong with um, taking an older story and retelling it. And it's not going to stop. So, you know, I think people who are kind of rebelling against uh, against remakes tell that to Bill Shakespeare. That's what I'll say. <laughs> well, you're right that they do clean up at the box office. Their first one, Cinderella, um, made $542 million, So pretty good, but not wow. massive. Five forty-two. That's oh, a lot. no, no, no. It's going to get a lot bigger. And I'm just, I'm giving you these as context. And Dumbo made three hundred and fifty-three million. That was their lowest, I believe. The Lion King, however, made one point six six billion. Aladdin made a billion. Beauty and the Beast made one point two six billion. And Jungle Book made just under a billion. So they're cash cows. And you know, I think that Mulan is kind of a good example of 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 why, you know, this is a movie that you can watch with your kids. And because everybody already knows the title of Mulan, it's got that kind of built in audience. People want to see how they're going to be, you know, making these into live action from an, from, from an animated classic. So yeah, keep it's like uh, talking about with Sonic, you know, you, you take something that the parents will like for certain reasons and the kids will like for other reasons. And when you do that, then you get the the family audience, and the adults are are not they're not upset about going to some of these. Um, I actually really liked the Beauty and the Beast uh, remake as well. I haven't seen all of them. Uh, it's kind of I, I really have a hard time. I do like Will Smith, but <laughs> Robin Williams as the genie is kind of like might be the greatest animated performance of all time. Um, so I've always had a hard time like wanting to go back and see that one, especially when it is mostly a word for word replication from what I understand. And yeah. I, that's why I kind of like the fact that Mulan isn't, it's not trying to do that. I would rather see something new also. Yeah. I'm with you on that. Can I ask you one more question? Sure. So Paul Although Burns. We only agreed to one. To one what's that? We only agreed to one question each. But oh, I you know, I, I love to break the rules, Brian. I will allow this. Paul Burns of the Sunday Sydney Morning Herald wrote in his review of the film, apart from the lack of singing, romance, comedy, and a mouthy dragon, this is just like the original. You might wonder what's left. Well, $200 million buys a lot of scenery and sets and quite a few stars. This version has spectacle on its mind. So my question to you is, does it achieve that spectacle, were you thinking of this movie as an epic while you were watching it? I think the spectacle is a strength for sure. I mean, look at this Look at this uh, movie poster that we have on the screen here. I like that poster. It's a great poster. And, and um, you know, the bright color it got, it, it was nominated for its for its costumes and its sets. And um, I love- I, I just looked it up, by the way. It was nominated yeah. for best music, not okay. costumes and sets. Well, correction department. I don't know. We're going to have to do another correction <laughs> department on the bottom here. But anyway, the, um, I think that, yes, it, it does a great job of epic. I mean, the, the, the other issue that I have with it is we just did Crouching Tiger, right? A, a few weeks ago on our podcast, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Um, and when you see that, the martial arts are like at the super pro level. And when you watch the martial arts here, it feels like it's sort of at the semi-pro level, even though they have the big stars, but it, it certainly is not the same kind of intensity and the same impressive, you know, um, impressive performances, I guess, or spectacle on the martial arts part. Well, but on that note, remember, 
Remember that Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon was only made for about $17 million. This was made for $200 million. And so <laughs> keeping, keeping that in mind, I can't say that it did feel like an epic to me. I mean, it does look pretty great. I'll say that for sure. And I like that sort of wuxia influence. You know, we talked about, about that, that style of movie making in the Crouching Tiger episode that people could find in our feed. But mostly, I just think that the budget adds to a feeling of polish. You know, those locations are great but they don't pay off in bigger ways. I don't, at least I, they didn't for me. Um, the fights were cool, but like not really inventive. Like I mentioned those other connections to movies we've seen before. So it was kind of grand, not, not bad, you know, it's sort of one of those movies that you maybe, I don't know. I feel like you feel like you could have had a better time in if, if things were a little bit different. It goes back to audience too. I mean, you're, you're sort of, I think it's sort of like an introduction to martial arts movies for people who don't really watch martial arts movies. It's true. I'm not, I, a, I, big, I'm not a big, I'm not a big fan of them necessarily. I don't go out of my way to watch martial arts movies typically. I didn't realize going in that this is a PG 13. And so I was watching it with an eight year old and I was actually kind of surprised that these fight scenes, you know, there's a lot of arrows and a lot of stabbings. Yeah. And, in that way, I thought, well, maybe this isn't, you know, a perfect family movie, but there's there's not blood, and so it it's it's passable. Um, but because of that, then it's not really an adult action movie either. You know, it it yeah. plays it very, very, very down the middle. It's for kind of a, it's like a barely PG thirteen, which does which is uh, I didn't really. I mean, my youngest kids did not want to watch it, um, but um, I didn't think that it was really too too bad for younger kids. Yeah, it's all right. Let's take a quick break to welcome any newcomers to the show. If you're just joining us, welcome. We're talking about Disney's live action remake of Mulan, which is playing for free at 1 p.m. Saturday, May 29th at the Flather County Public Library. And if you like what you hear today, you can subscribe to our show, Best Picture This, and listen to our full catalog of 30 episodes and counting by clicking on that subscribe button that's over this way. <laughs> it's, over, it's over that way. Um, right there on the bottom left. We're also on Spotify and Stitcher or wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, now let's get back to it, Brian. What might have been? Let's jump in. We should also say thanks again to the Palm Coast Observer, which is yes. my, my employer. And uh, you can check out other, uh, we're kind of increasing our YouTube offerings with observations shows, um, inter which are interviews with uh, newsmakers in Palm Coast. And also, there will be episodes of this show, Best Picture This, on uh, on YouTube. So you can check that out, uh, the Palm Coast Observer YouTube channel. So we're going to do what might have been. Um, I have six, five things I want to mention to you um, about how this movie could have gone. So here's an example. In 2010, they were talking about making this movie. Um, so 10 years ago. That's a long time to be talking about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. So the original director was Chuck Russell. I had to look Chuck Russell up. Yeah. His first movie that he directed was in 1987, Elm Street, Nightmare on Elm Street 3, which I'm sure you saw. Mike, you've, seen, you've seen every Nightmare on Elm Street movie, right? I have, yeah. Okay. That was his debut movie. His next movie was The Blob the next year. Then he directed Jim Carrey in 1994's The Mask. Ooh, smoking. Then, <laughs> then he directed Arnold Schwarzenegger in Eraser in 1996. Nice. So this is kind of an interesting guy to go from there and didn't do a lot in between them that he was going to do Mulan. Um, it didn't work out. Just so you know, his next movie, Chuck Russell, is a Hawaiian crime movie called Paradise City that's supposed to be coming out it's starring Bruce Willis and John Travolta, although... John Travolta often comes up in these, how he almost did some movies and then didn't. So yeah. I'll, I'll be excited to see if he actually makes it. <laughs> if he makes it through all of the production. <laughs> <laughs> so the second, what might have been, is that Zi Zhang was originally going to play Mulan. She's the one who played um, the younger lead in Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Yeah. So seems like she could do anything. So Jet Li. I have a couple things about Jet Li. Jet Li plays the emperor. He originally turned down the role because of, quote, script and pay, unquote, <laughs> um, which is probably a bad sign when people are saying, we don't want this because of the script. But yeah. um, his daughters reminded him 
that is important for Disney to shine a light on Chinese culture. So he went along with it and played the emperor. Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> noble acts, I guess. Noble, very noble. Honor, honor to the family. <laughs> Um, so this is not about this movie, but Jet Li was also originally going to be the the, the main character in Crouching Tiger, uh, Li Mu Bai, who was um, uh, Chow Yun Fat. Fat. Yeah. Chow Yun Fat. He turned it down because his wife was pregnant. What a guy! Well, listen, he got his chance with Hero right after Crouching Tiger made the world aware of these types of movies, and then he killed it in that one. So I still have. Seen hero, so I need to make sure I do that. I'll somebody, let you borrow it sometime. Somebody needs to become a patron and choose hero, so that we can go ahead and do that as a bonus. Yeah, I love that. Um, okay, the last thing is this is kind of interesting when this happens. There were two actors um, who I don't know, and it's hard to pronounce: Utkarsh Ambudkar and Chum Ahalo Ahapola. I'm sorry if I butchered oh, those. Boy. I'm pretty sure I did, but they were originally cast as Sketch and Ramtish, a couple of con artists in the story, and all their scenes were cut. Um, comic relief, probably? I guess. Comic relief com con artists. Um, it might have been kind of fun to see how that goes. It would be cool to see the uh, deleted scenes there. Um, but how would you feel, Mike, if you were contracted to go play this movie and you got your money? Let's say that you got your money. Mm-hmm. And then you go to the screening and you're not there. <laughs> well, I'm feeling less bad if I've got the paycheck in my bank <laughs> account. Is um, that all you care about, Mike? Well, it depends. I mean, if these people have not, if this, if they were thinking of this movie as their big break, this is going to be my first speaking role, then that's a major bummer to go into yeah. the theater and not see yourself there. But if they're kind of just like background guys, you know, they 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 fill in where they need to. Um, they know what to expect. That's always a risk. Yeah, too bad for them, right? Yeah. Um, I would love to have the role of telling people when all their scenes were cut from a movie. That would be wow. interesting. consulting business, right? To call so, you're kind of, so you'd kind of be like George Clooney and up in the air, who just flies yeah. from built from company to company, firing people. I'll just do it remotely. I mean, through video. I mean, what's the big deal? Wow. I never yeah. thought you were so heartless. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Let's do some trivia here. Yeah, let's get into it. Um, the first thing is we kind of mentioned that some of the songs are hinted at throughout the movie. Um, I don't really know those songs anyway, so I'm not one that's singing them along. When will my reflection show who I am inside, Brian? That's what So I you know the songs. You, oh, are yeah. you... Are you a shower singer of Mulan songs? Or <laughs> uh, no, I've been listening to podcasts in the shower lately. Oh, nice! Yeah, <laughs> we would love it if you would take us into your shower with with you as well. <laughs> Please do, um, dear dear viewer, dear listener. So the second thing is that uh, during the Imperial City battle, it was held up for several days after the trained eagle accidentally flew into the filming crew's helicopter rotors. Wow. R.I.P. You notice that there is no, did you know that there was no uh, disclaimer at the end of the movie that said no animal was harmed? Maybe they were. Maybe they were. Maybe Actually, they I were. didn't wait. I didn't wait that long. I don't, I didn't watch every tra every uh, credit in this one. But you kind of have to watch credits nowadays, don't you? Because of the end credits. No. Scene. No, so I, I don't stick around for the end credit scene. So you go to see Avengers and you don't go, you don't wait till the end. I'm out of there. I'm, I'm not going to spend an extra 15 minutes watching. And I'm, I apologize to anybody who worked on these films and they want to see their name, but I can't read that quickly. I'm not going to watch 15 minutes of words scrolling across the screen. I go out of there. If something's important, I can catch it on YouTube later. <laughs> that's, that's horrible. <laughs> Number three, in the cartoon, I should call the animated movie, the film, the animated film, um, mm -hmm. Mulan falls in love with uh, Li Shang yeah. was the uh, the commander, the general. And in this movie, they split these people, this guy up into two different characters. And mostly it's because they didn't want Mulan to fall in love with her old guy general um, because of hashtag me too. Do you think that that's a good move or is that, you know, not necessary? I mean, we're talking about an ancient story um, so what do you, what are you thinking, Mike? 
I think that's irrelevant because they still gave her a love story with a guy in her troop, except they didn't kiss at the end. But I mean, it was still obvious what was going on. Give away all everything about the love story here. I, I guess may, they may or may not kiss. We don't. Know. Yeah, they may or may not kiss. It's a, it's a will they won't they situation for the whole movie. Um, I I felt like they cut it more because it it, it, it it's complicating, and maybe that's something that. Um, is hard, harder to hide in a live action movie than in an animated when everything is a little bit goofy and we're not really thinking about real world implications so much. I think it makes a big deal. I think that when you have, when you have a general, you know, having a romantic relationship with a young female uh, recruit, it doesn't look good. And I, I think that uh, it's probably a good idea to change that. Yeah, I guess I don't remember so much in, in the, animated movie if the general was older i mean obviously he has a position of power and they they were aware of that enough to change it but they still kept the love story brian it's it's there well that's the benefit of me not watching the original is yeah. that i don't know all right the next thing is um number four is jet lee so just as a side a little bit of trivia jet lee was like a super stud as a very young kid at eight years old he won all these big tournaments as a uh um, he, he was a wushu uh, champion, which is sort of like a performance version of different martial arts styles. And uh, he won five gold medals and championships, when, including when he was only 11 years old. And his prize, so he got to fly to Washington, D.C. and meet Richard Nixon. That is a good prize. That is a good prize. Yeah, I guess. I guess so. At the time, I'm sure it was. It you, was wouldn't an honor. Meet, you wouldn't want to meet Richard Nixon? <laughs> before watergate i'm sure i would have wanted to meet richard nixon <laughs> all right so last point of trivia the writers let's learn a little bit about the writers rick jaffa and amanda silver are two of the writers their husband and wife cool and uh, they also wrote um among other things uh planet of the apes a couple three planet of the apes movies jurassic world and they are among the writers on Avatar 3, which mm -hmm. is in post-production according to IMDb. But we've heard so many rumors about Avatar sequels that who knows how long it'll be. But so when you say when you say Planet of the Apes, you're talking about the latest iteration. Yeah, yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah, the la the latest one in the past 10 years or so. They did three of those. Yep. So that's all the trivia I got. In the next episode. Well, I don't know if it's the next one you're gonna hear. But we will soon be talking also about Tenet, Christopher Nolan's latest mind-bending movie. I have not seen Tenet yet. I'm very excited to watch it. You haven't either? Okay, cool. I haven't either. I'm looking forward to it. I've kind of, there, I've had a few opportunities, but I said, no, no, I've got to wait for Best Picture this. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's showing at the library on June 11th. So next week on June 4th, we'll be going live again. Is that the 4th? Maybe it's a week after that. Anyway, June 4th. A week before that episode, before that movie is available to watch, we'll uh, we'll walk you through some fun stuff about Christopher Nolan and uh, that movie. Yeah, and as for our regular scheduled programming, we're currently walking working through the Best Picture nominees of 2002, including the Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers, The Pianist, Gangs of New York, and more. We've released full seasons on the films of 1999, 2000, and 2001 in our catalog, uh, and we sprinkle in bonus episodes every at least every couple of weeks. You can find all of that at bestpicturethis.com on Spotify or Apple Podcasts by clicking that button. Stitcher, wherever else you get your podcasts. We're also on Facebook and Twitter at Best Picture This. And for 15 years of golden takes, head over to Letterboxd where you'll find me, Mike Cavalieri. Just about every one of Mike's takes are golden, except don't read his review of Monster Ball. <laughs> uh, do you have a favorite movie from the past that doesn't get the attention it deserves? Well, become a patron of the show by visiting patreon.com slash best picture this, and you can help pick a future movie. Uh, upcoming movies that we'll be doing based on patron choices are The Fly from 1986 and Garden State. Yep, and another one rolling in soon, number three. Finally, we want to hear from you. Send in any thoughts you had on today's show, whether you agreed or disagreed with our takes to bestpicturethis at gmail.com, and we will read your insights on next show. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Until next time, I think by now, I mean, I think we know Mulan pretty well, the, you know, the character, the young yep. lady. 
that if she were to pick a podcast to listen to, it would it would probably be best picture of this. So she would probably even share this video, you know, if she were watching. So be like Mulan and uh, stick with us. For <laughs> That's great advice and well put, Brian. Thanks for watching, everyone. Have a great weekend. Bye.